Well, hello. Welcome. Top of the morning to you, Governor. Ah, oh, radio. <laughs> Well, it's earlier than usual, and it's already hot, hotter than Hades. And we're going to do the proverb. Today is the eighth day of the eighth month of the 2016th year of our Lord. <laughs> uh, should be interesting. Uh, I mentioned that the proverbs, the earlier proverbs, are reiterated throughout the whole of proverbs. And the first few are kind of important to kind of get the hang of them. And then you'll see the reoccurring themes uh, re, you know, re-mentioned. So, uh, before I do that, I wanted to talk about two things in particular. Um, let's see, words. Be careful with your words. Um, word smith. You know, smith your words like you would, uh, if you think about blacksmith, uh, figures of speech, right? I love figures of speech. Man, that's a huge fly. Uh, sorry. Um, they say strike while the iron is hot. Okay? If you don't know what that means, when a blacksmith would make something out of metal, and this is, you know, generally speaking, there's other types of smithing when it comes to metal, but they have what's called a forge. That's the furnace. You heat the metal up, it gets red hot. You know, you always see in the movies where it's glowing. Uh, once it's glowing, it's malleable or it can be shaped, right? And so a hammer usually have a hammer, right? And they'll, they'll whack the metal when it's red hot. And the hotter it is, the more bendable it can be. And different metals have different compositions chemically, and so different heats will make them either turn to liquid or... Um, oh, I'm leaking over here. <laughs> they'll either turn to liquid and melt, like what I'm doing, or they'll, um, they'll just get really flexible. You know, the hardest metal, when it's heated up enough, will bend. Sometimes you don't even have to heat it up too much for it to bend, and it can be the hardest metal. It's pretty crazy, really. Um, but so, striking while the iron's hot, if the iron's cool, you can hammer it all day long. It's not really going to do anything, or it's not going to do what you want it to, right? So, to smith, like a sword's usually the example I use. Um, you put the put the iron or steel or whatever it is, you put the metal in there. While it's hot, once it gets hot enough, you pull it out. And then you hammer it. And as it cools down, you can tell in the hammering process that it's losing its um, malleability. Then you got to put it back in there and heat it back up again and hammer it some more. And you do that process over and over until you get it how you want it. Then they put it in the water to temper it and cool it and blah, blah, blah. So... If you don't strike while the iron's hot, you might miss your opportunity. Basically, that's one figure of speech. Another figure of speech is too many irons in the fire. You can only hammer one iron at a time, unless you have mad skills, right? But even then, maybe two or three, but you, you eventually, if you have too many irons in the fire, if they all get hot at the same time, how are you going to prioritize which one to hammer, which one to pull out, when to pull it out? If you leave it in too long, you can, like I said, it might turn to liquid. So there's a timing is very critical. And the reason why I mention these idioms and figures of speech is because um, words are important. You have the power of life and death in your tongue. And you speak life into things or you speak death um, into things. Uh, no man or woman can bridle the tongue. A bridle is something you put on, it's like a harness, you know. So nobody can harness the tongue. And uh, the speech comes from the heart, right, usually. And your heart is ruled by emotions. And emotions can cloud your judgment, your reason, your logic. I always think of Spock, you know, like, <laughs> that is illogical to have emotion. <laughs> um, but you can't, you can't not feel. We're humans. But what do you do with those feelings? I always say it's not about if you get angry or not. It's what do you do with your anger. And same with words, you know. I need to be more careful with my words. Now, cussing's one thing. Um, it's not, you know, what does it say? Ill communications corrupt good manners. You know, it's hard to have good manners when you're dropping the F-bomb every other word. Um, if you could find a, a more euphemistic way of saying something, you know, a euphemism is when you say something in a nicer way than the blunt, straightforward path, right? Uh, 
I could give you a few examples, but I won't. I don't want to be too crude this early in the morning. Um, uh, but yeah, so words are important. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to tie this in to something odd and different than usual. But, um, you know, waking up, we keep talking about the process or it's a process. I was talking to somebody very special to me about this um, earlier today, technically. But for me, it would have been last night. Uh, um, a lot of times when we wake up, rather it be to conspiracy or to Jesus Christ and salvation or any kind of deeper truth or, you know, the deception that's going on everywhere, the political system, the government, the military, the industry, blah, 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 right? Well, when people start to wake up, it might take one topic to wake them up. Then they might start questioning their reality or their paradigm, right? And the paradigm is the worldview that you have from your own internal perspective. A paradigm shift is when something is so game-changing you have to rethink everything you thought you knew. Well, when you get born again, your whole paradigm is gone. <laughs> and it's... God will rewire you, but it's going to take a while sometimes. It's not just an... Overnight, you're, you're a new creation. Yes, overnight. Or in the, in the twinkling of an eye. As soon as you believe, you are changed. But getting this, the skin and flesh and the heart and the mind to follow where the spirit all of a sudden now is born again and trying to go. Um, it can be a very difficult process. And oftentimes when we get born again to Christ and having faith and believing in the scriptures and stuff like that. It can be a scary thing. Uh, it can be an exciting thing and it can be exhilarating uh, to the point to where you get so on fire for God you might start burning everybody around you with truth and sometimes that's good sometimes it's bad sometimes we get overzealous and I'm, I was guilty of that more often more than one time in my life I've gotten overzealous and when you've been living wrong your whole life and then you start living right and you start seeing the fruits of your labor um, then you start to get momentum and you get excitement and you want to push harder and faster and you want to be more forward thinking and acting and then you start seeing everybody around you and you're thinking man I want those people to get with the program too especially when it comes to salvation if you know you have a spouse a sibling a best friend a childhood friend whatever it is a co-worker somebody you didn't genuinely care for and you know they're not a believer uh, or maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but you don't know, and it's kind of a touchy subject to approach. You know, when we see other people not doing right, not living right, uh, you know, work is a good example on a secular level. You might be doing your job really well, and you might actually be picking up the slack for a couple slackers and doing more than what you should be doing. And then you look around and you see the person who maybe is above you or is getting paid more than you or has been there less time and makes more money, or someone who's more qualified yet they don't have the experience you have. And you see them dragging ass or dragging their feet or not working and then you're the one doing all the work and where's your credit? Where's the reciprocation in your pay? Where's the appreciation, right? And it's it scorns you to sit there and be doing above and beyond your call of duty to see other people who should be at least doing the same amount of work. But in reality, if their title gives them more responsibility and they're not doing it, you know, that you want those co-workers to get with the program. Well, spiritually, it's worse because it's an eternal soul on the line. When it comes to conspiracy, that's one of the hardest things to wake people up to is truth. Uh, there's a Native American proverb I have on my timeline on Facebook. And it says you can't wake somebody up who's pretending to be asleep. <laughs> a lot of times, people aren't really as asleep as they let on. Everybody plays the fool. Sometimes, <laughs> uh, you know, as some people, I think of the Matrix. There's a scene on there where the guy's selling out his his homies, and uh, he's eating a steak dinner in in the Matrix, which is a fake program for the mind. It's not even real. And he's talking to the Agent Smith, right, the bad guy that's you know part of the machine, I guess. And uh, he's holding a little steak on his fork, and he's all like. I know this steak isn't real. I know this is just a, you know, biological electric stimulus to my brain that's telling me, yes, this is steak. It looks nice and juicy. And then he, he's like, you know, it tastes delicious in my mouth. And I know it's all not real. It's basically a bunch of BS. 
but ignorance is bliss right and so I'd rather go back to knowing if it tastes good if it thinks I mean like if it feels good do it mentality right and if there's responsibility and obligation and there's a hard truth over here well, even though I know the truth is over there, I don't really want to know anymore. I know more than I wanted to now, and if I had known now what I knew then, or if I knew then what I know now, I would have just skipped this whole thing, right? And so I think a lot of the truth in this world is too scary for a lot of people. Um, so if they wake up to one thing, maybe they can wake up to more, but everybody wakes up on their own. So I was talking to my special someone about last night was... Um, when people are in a process of either being asleep or pretending to be asleep or slowly waking up, I said, what's better to wake somebody up softly and nicely and slowly when, you know, they're not a morning person or just to just dump the cold or hot water on them and say, wake the hell up. It's time to get up. You know, you sluggard, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think any of us woke up like that and we wouldn't have liked waking up that way. You know, Flat Earth is a good example. I'm not 100% pro-Flat Earth yet. Um, I'm leaning more towards that way, but I am not in a hurry to decide or make my mind up. It's not a salvation issue, and it might bring people to salvation or to want to read the scriptures, and that's great. But honestly, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, to a limited degree, I care, but look, that's not flat. I live on a big ass hill, man. Guys, it goes up like that. It's like Kenya over here. It's not Kilimanjaro, but it feels like it sometimes. So calling it flat earth does a disservice. It's not flat. There's hills, there's valleys, there's mountains. Uh, I don't know. You can't call it flat earth. You can call it planar, you can call it a bunch of things, but is it a globe? I don't know. Is it a sphere? I don't know. I don't know if you can prove one way or the other. Prove it. I don't know if you can prove it one way or the other. But you don't have to have proof to believe things. That's the that's the that's the thing. Everybody wants to prove everybody else right or wrong. I don't care if I'm right or wrong. Like I would prefer to be right. I think I'm right more often than not. But when I'm wrong, oh okay. If I cared about being right, I might defend being wrong. When I, I want to be right and I think I'm right. So I think we have to get to a level to where Okay, so this ties in, right? People wake up at their own pace. People believe at their own pace. Some people need all the evidence in the world. Some people just need someone they trust to tell them. That's what I think. That's what I believe, you know? And um, it's good to have a healthy measure of skepticism. You shouldn't just believe everything you hear or read or see, especially if it's on TV. Um, but at the other, uh, on the other hand, you know, if you're over skeptical about everything, then how do you ever know when to believe anything or when to put trust in anything? So I understand it's hard to trust God, right? You can't see him. You can't smell him. You can't hear him ver ver audibly, usually, you know, I mean, it's just, it's an important thing. Faith is very important and it's what separates us from the angels. Uh, we're made a little lower than them, but we have more glory for God in us because we have faith. And faith, the Bible says, is belief in the things unseen. Okay, I can't see the earth from a gazillion miles away and see if there's a curve or not. And is there deception? More than likely. But is the truth completely one way or the other? I don't know. And I'm not in a hurry to figure it out. But my point of bringing that up was is that there's a lot of people that woke up to God because they question science and the reality that's been fabricated for us to understand in the sense to where the narrative we've been given by the experts and the, you know, the people with the experience, you know, like uh, the, I can't even think of it, academia, you know, the guys who are supposed to be the smarty pants in the world, well, they all agree on a few things, and so now we're supposed to believe it too, so they believe it. I just, uh, I don't know, it's its getting crazy to the point to where people don't even, they don't even understand the words that are coming out of their own mouths, right? And so I think we have to be careful about what we say, and I think we have to, it says gird up the loins of your mind in the scripture, which means, I always hear this, you should have an open mind, right? Well, be open-minded. problem with an open mind is you can let anything come track mud in, you know? You keep a door closed for a reason because you don't want anything just coming on in the house. 
So you don't just leave your open door to your house open at all times. You know, you get bugs, animals, pests, uh, maybe people you don't want coming on, walking and strolling right on in like they own the joint. I mean, same thing with your mind. If you just leave your mind wide open, anything can get in there. And not everything is good to be open to. So, just some food for thought, right? Um, okay, so I've got too many irons in the fire in this conversation, and it's my own fault, but... <laughs> see how this works, how it applies, right? Um, if we can't change something, I can't change how fast you wake up. I can hinder how fast you wake up by giving you too much stimulation, giving you too much to wake up to at once. Um, I can slow you down by telling you what you have to do, what you should be doing, you know, nobody likes to hear that. So you can, you can do more harm than good depending on how you come across, but one plants, one waters, God brings the increase, it doesn't say, hey, you dig the hole, you plant the seed, you water it. You weed it, you do all the work, and then you get to get the rewards of all that labor. That's not how God says to do it. If one plants and another waters, maybe you're supposed to do one or the other, but not both. And if you're trying to do both, maybe they need a second opinion, right? Or a third opinion. You go to a doctor and they tell you something you don't agree with. Here in this country, you, you used to be able to go to another doctor and get a second opinion. But I won't go there, so... Wise counsel. Seek the wise counsel. Don't just go to one wise person. Go to counsel. Count, you know, a wise counsel is more than one. Um, right now, especially when it comes to conspiracy, I see, and I had a good conversation with a good friend of mine yesterday uh, about this. Acceptance. You have to accept things if you want to be change or make a change. If something's unacceptable, until you accept it, you're not going to be able to move on or move forward. You're going to be um, overwhelmed. You're going to be held back. You're going to be oppressed by the thought of it. The lack of control is going to create anxiety, fear, depression maybe, anger, whatever. I mean, it's, it can manifest in a lot of different ways, but a good example is my child is no longer with the living. Uh, I can't do anything about that. It's unacceptable, in my opinion, to have a, a parent lose a child. But I have to come to terms with that. I have to accept it. I don't find it acceptable, but once I accepted it, I was able to deal with it and move forward. Uh, you never get over something like that. Um, but it's a prime example of accepting something that's unacceptable and then being able to cope and manage and deal with it. If I was still butthurt about it right now, and I, you know, I use that figuratively because it, it's still painful obviously but if I was still in my feelings about it to the degree to where I was just devastated completely um, you know I would be useless my em I would be arrested in my development emotionally physically mentally spiritually I would be dead in the water right and that's not what God wants and if we can't it says cast all your concerns or cares on him because he cares for you. If you're not casting all, it says all. If you're casting 99% of it, that 1% selfish for you to keep on to it so you can sit there and be in your feelings about it. Right? So I gave it all to God in the process. And then after it took some time to re realize I still had some residual, I gave that to God too. And when it hits me hard sometimes because grief comes in waves, I give it to God every time it comes. Uh, I can't think of a time where I just sat there and was depressed for two or three days about it. And maybe I'm cold-hearted, whatever, but... I can't change it, so why, why let it kill me too? She's gone, why should I let her death create more death in me? And that's just one extreme example, but... Um, you know, as it, as it goes to conspiracy, there's a lot of things happening against us as people uh, that are not good or godly. And uh, the more we know, the more terror it can create within you. It can strike fear into your heart, literally. Um, 
and how this ties back to words is a good example is um, chemtrails okay some of y'all might believe in them some of you might not I don't really um, I'm not really concerned about what you think about chemtrails I'm not concerned about if you believe in them or not because you know why we can't do anything to change it <laughs> okay wow imagine that what difference does it make if you believe in it or not I believe they're real. I see them almost every day. It's been a little less lately than usual, but I've been paying attention to it for years now. It's not new to me, and it's it's a growing thing. There's communities that are, you know, sky watching and documenting where and when and and all those all those types of deals. But I don't want to go real deep into chemtrails because I could go really deep into the topic, but. Does my grandma need to know about chemtrails? Am I going to tell her about barium and aluminum uh, oxide and strontium? And you know, is she going to even give two shits about it? I don't think so. And if she did understand and get it, what is she going to do? She's going to be 80, I think. Is she just going to sit there and go out and start protesting? Well, when has carrying a sign ever stopped the government from doing anything? But at the end of the day, it's like we don't know who's doing it. We can only speculate as to why. Uh, we can see how. And even, all this stuff is shrouded in secrecy and mystery, so... But the main point why I brought this up is, A, we have to accept that that's the reality. And the Bible tells us reality is going to get really bad. Wow, imagine that. There's going to be lots of bad guys running the show. Oh, wow, imagine that. <laughs> the Bible told me so, alright? Well, so did George Bush 20 years ago. New world order, new world order. Okay, wow. It's a, I'm starting to put these dots together, and I'm just like... Who's surprised that the world's going to hell in a handbasket? Not me. <laughs> it's sad. I smile and giggle about it, but it just means it's closer to Christ coming back. So it's not going to be, everything's not going to get fixed by a magic wand. And no matter how Christian you are and how much you follow Christ, the world is going to die. Uh, sorry. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but judgment comes, then wrath, then the utter destruction completely, and then a new creation. That's the hope we have. And when God tells you you can hope in something, you can rest assured it's 100% guaranteed. Uh, I think it's in Second Peter, if you want to read about the fervent heat melting the elements. Which brings me to my conclusion. Words are important, so acceptance. Acceptance doesn't mean you... you like what's happening acceptance doesn't mean it's acceptable activity or behavior acceptance just means hey I understand to the best of my ability and I accept that that is what it is now that I can assess it as being an unacceptable I've accepted it into my paradigm and now I understand it for what it is as best I can based on the information I have to go on and from there, now that I know it's unacceptable, but I can accept it as part of what I understand to be true, now what can I do about it? And more often than not, if you can't do anything about it, accept the fact you can't do anything about it. Uh, the serenity prayer, real, very cliche, but, uh, you know, if you can change it, change it. Have courage in, in doing that. If you cannot change it, accept the fact you can't change it and move along. Otherwise, like I said, you'll just get overwhelmed and you'll get locked in and you'll get stuck in a bad spot and it'll be a place where I look at it like a flat tire on a car or I mean not, not a flat tire but a tire that gets stuck in the mud. Okay, well, there's a way to get out of the mud if you do it right. If you do it wrong though, if you get too much gas, if you don't have a wedge, uh, you're just going to spin your tire, like spinning your wheels. You've heard some, that's another figure of speech, spinning your wheel. Yeah, they're just spinning their wheels. Okay, well, if you hit the gas and the tire starts spinning, it's going to fling mud, and all it's going to do is dig a bigger hole for itself. That's what happens when you care too much about something you can't change. And last thing about this before I go into the final conclusion, but you can't change anybody else. You can't make anybody believe or do anything. You can change your mind, you can change your heart, you can change your thought process, you can change your actions, you can change the things around you that you can influence. That's it. But when you lead by example and you be the change that you want, you know, 
then other people will see that and it, it creates a ripple effect and then um, yeah, that's how you if you you can't change the world you can change yourself that is your world is yourself we're in the world but we're not of it right how you experience cannot be validated by anybody else or invalidated by anybody else your experience is yours and yours alone and it's between you and God in your mind nobody hears your thoughts nobody can read your mind nobody knows what's going on in your heart nobody knows your true intentions everybody is an individual you're born alone you'll die alone even if you're a twin you're still alone inside your own body these bodies are just vehicles that we're riding in until we die then we'll go to the next ride and one's fun and one's not so my point of saying this though is that God knows all those things God can see and hear all those things God knew you before you were even thinking about these things so he knows where you're going he knows where you've been and there's nowhere you can go to get outside or away from that so I don't know I mean I could go on and, you know lecture about this for a long time but Accept the things you cannot change, and change the things you cannot accept. And if you change yourself, then you can make a difference in the world. That difference can help other people see how to change themselves, and then the world can change. That's what I say. Uh, very rarely will you see one individual, and Jesus aside, right? But, but very rarely will you see one individual that changed the entire world. They might have had an influence or made a difference. But nobody changes the whole world by themselves. They change themselves by themselves with the help of God. And from that point, that ripples, right? And so that's that. Words are important because how you use them is, is very important, okay? And I, I take this back to the chemtrails. And, yeah, 26 minutes. We're doing all right. Chemtrails, okay? What is chemtrail? Chemtrail means chemical trail. When you have an airplane, when I was a little kid, you'd see an airplane going by, right? And sometimes you'd see nothing going behind it. Sometimes you'd see the, the plane over here, and then there'd be a little trail of smoke coming out. There'd usually be a pretty good gap between the plane and the smoke. I always thought it was smoke, you know? Um, but it's not smoke. It's, it's called a con trail. What is con trail? Con trail means condensation. Condensation is like, uh, if it's hot enough out here, if this was cold and there'd be ice, you'd see little sweat droplets on the outside of my cup. Well, the moisture condenses, so condensation, right? It's the precipitation of condensation. Uh, when you have a plane at a high altitude and it's giving out heat and you have a, a colder temperature, the air differential will create ice crystals in the atmosphere and that's what condensation trail is. It's condensation that has frozen for a short time. And it's usually with jet airplanes. It has a lot to do with the heat that comes out of the exhaust, etc. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's pretty commonsensical stuff, but if you don't know, you don't know. So, but every, I, most people can remember in their past seeing airplanes and you see a little white plume coming out the back and that plume would dissipate tracking with the plane's progress it never stayed it didn't stick around it didn't linger it was the plane goes by that leaves the trail the trail slowly fades away uh, really i always thought it was cool to look at well i don't even know how long it's been going on there's you know i was born in 81 Growing up in the 80s and 90s, I used to lay in the grass and just look at the sky a lot. Um, and I remember this. I don't remember ever seeing persistent contrails. Okay? That's that's what they're trying to say chemtrails are. Now, there is a thing called geoengineering. Geoengineering is they're engineering the globe or the earth. Geo means earth um, as a root. And I could be a little off on it, but geo usually means um, like earth science or knowledge of earth, geology, earth, rocks, same, same, geo is, usually means earth. So you have geoengineering, they're engineering the earth, right? They're trying to take dominion and control over the earth. And they say it's to stop global warming, um, blah, 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 blah. So I'm going into more detail than I really wanted, but this is the thing. When you know you've seen a chemtrail, okay, it stays up there and then it spreads out laterally or sideways. 
condensation doesn't continue to freeze and turn into more freeze. That doesn't make any sense. The water doesn't spread out sideways in the sky. That doesn't make sense, okay? Usually in uh, water, the, the sun heats things up, right? Well, if it was ice crystals, they can't stay frozen forever. Hmm. I've seen chemtrails. I've seen them last all day long. And they spread laterally into other chemtrails, and that's why they make the grids, is to get wider coverage. We learned about these kind of dispersion tactics when we learned about chemical warfare in the military and in the infantry. They talk about, you know, when you want to drop a chemical weapon, well, drop it where the wind, you know, will blow it right onto the people you're trying to kill. Or if you're, um... If you're downwind and you smell this smell of cherry almonds, you know, uh, head for the hills, put on your mop suit, you know, it's a, uh, I don't know. Anyways, my whole point of bringing all this up was, if you, if you mention chemtrails, people say, oh, you're a crazy loon, you know, you're a chem, uh, you know, conspiracy theorist and you're crazy. Okay, well, when you have the argument, you're like, okay, well, they, there's, I've got on my uh, documentary playlist two documentaries if you're curious about any of this stuff but what, what in the world are they spraying why in the world are they spraying uh, very good documentaries and uh, check them out I would highly recommend both of them It's a, one's a sequel to the first one but it was one of the biggest mind blows I've ever had and I'd already been researching and studying about it but it's real hard to find good information it's getting more and more documented now and whistleblowers and blah 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 but this is the thing right chemtrail means chemical trail they're claiming that there's aluminum oxide and barium and strontium and other chemicals that basically make the blood barrier of your brain more permeable which means stuff can go through it the blood barrier in your brain is supposed to protect toxins from getting into your brain and uh, aluminum is a heavy metal it uh, accumulates in in your body um, blah 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 it's 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 bad for you okay it's not vitamin C they're spraying up there it's bad stuff and they say it's for they say they're not even doing it first of all and then if they were doing it is to stop global warming but then they say that once they start doing it they can't stop because the earth will get addicted to it like a drug and then they talk about how cheap it is to do it on a worldwide level right so they're not doing it <laughs> but you can look up and see it now if you don't believe me if you don't believe what I'm saying you don't have to I don't care I'm not trying to convince you of anything I'm just getting to a semantical argument if you go to NASA's website and I'm not saying you should trust NASA at all but if you go to NASA's website and look up persistent contrail that's now what they're labeling these things it's not a chemtrail it's not a contrail, it's a persistent contrail. Persistent means it sticks around, okay? They, uh, if you look at the people who are in charge of weather and meteorology and that kind of stuff, they've created new categories of clouds. And all the times of being alive and looking at clouds and uh, observing clouds, all of a sudden we have new clouds now. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> And they're all chemtrail clouds, by the way. So, uh, anyway, so this is the thing. This is the key of un to understand what I'm getting at, because it's I'm going the long way around, the scenic route, right? If you go to NASA's website and you look at contrail, persistent contrails, if they still have it up, it might be gone by now. Um, that's been there for a couple years, though. It has all of the same detrimental effects, aside from the toxins of how it affects us once it falls down. What goes up must come down. All the stuff they spray up there falls down on us that they're spraying above. Uh, I, I can't help but to keep going into detail. I'm really trying to not go off on this. This is the morning proverb. This isn't the night talk, but... Um, all of the same things that they say that it'll do to help on the geoengineering side, right? Because these are scientists that are saying this. They're saying it'll help fight against global warming. But that they're not doing it yet. Now, if you go to NASA's website, and that's geoengineers talking about Kim trailing. Like talking about doing what, what we're knowing that they are already doing. 
On the other side, though, you look at NASA, and NASA's like, oh yeah, we've got these new things, persistent contrails, it's because of additives in the fuel of the planes, and blah, blah, blah. When you read, it says, yeah, these are detrimental to the environment. And it goes on and it explains quite a bunch about what the persistent contrails do, their effect on the atmosphere, blah, 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 blah. And as it turns out, the persistent contrails do the same thing the chemtrails do anyways, except for in reverse. The chemtrails bounce light back out into space, supposedly, and it stops us from being over-radiated, which creates less heat, and the greenhouse effect is less because we don't have as much penetrating our atmosphere. However, it does create a greenhouse effect in that nothing that's in our, our lower atmosphere can get out. But it basically creates a nano metal particle blanket. Okay, that's the easy way to put it. And this nano blanket basically keeps the things inside and keeps the things bounced off the outside, right? It's almost like a pseudo nano um, fir um, firmament, really, if you think about it. Some people connect it to Project Blue Beam to be like a nano um, screen that's invisible to do holographic projection. That's very possible. <sighs> Ten minutes later. Okay. All right. I'm gonna quit talking about this. Well, if y'all want to know about chemtrails, let me know, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll just make a video all about chemtrails and the implications and possibilities. But this is my point. When someone says they don't exist send them to nasa's website they'll probably believe those nassholes and those guys are saying hey well there's no such thing as chemtrails but we do have persistent contrails and these persistent contrails are horrible for our environment okay well that's one step in the right direction to wake someone up slowly well i find a lot of people who think they're smarty pants and know physics and want to talk about altitude and talk about wind currents and talk about blah 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 okay all right mr smarty pants well, you want to get into it? This is the debate. If you want to win a debate against an anti chemtrailist forever, this is what you do. And they say, that's not a chemtrail, that's a contrail. Ask them what a contrail is. And if they say, oh, it's, well, it's water vapor that's condensed and frozen, blah, blah, blah. Okay, ask them what water is. And they say, what are you, stupid? Like, no, just tell me what water is. What is water? Uh, well, it's liquid. All right, well, that's not what I'm saying. Define water. And then people eventually at some point will say H2O. It's a molecule. Okay, what's a molecule? A molecule is uh, one or more elements is put together. Okay, so you have hydrogen and oxygen. Wow. So you mean to tell me that we have hydrogen and oxygen and they're bonded together with a chemical bond? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so those are the contrails made out of water. All right, well, is water... A chemical? Hmm. <sighs> wow, so you mean a contrail is a chemical trail? Hmm. Where's their argument now? Okay, what chemical's better for you? Water or aluminum oxide and barium? Okay, that's a no-brainer. How do we get barium, aluminum oxide in our soil, in our air? Where does that come from? It's not a naturally occurring thing in the dirt. Hmm, maybe they'll start to question things because it's all in the words. Linguistics is important. Language is important. Semantics, the art of how you use the language is important. But when it comes to chemtrails, a contrail is still a chemical trail. As long as it has a chemical bond, it's a chemical. Okay, water doesn't just naturally split into hydrogen and oxygen on its own. It has to have its chemical bond broken and something has to be outwardly affecting it to do that. Okay, so that's it. Words are important. Use your words wisely. Think about what words mean when you're actually understanding what people are saying. You win a, a, the argument 100% of the time. I haven't heard one person that can make an argument against water molecule being not a chemical. Based on science and the standard definitions, water is a chemical. Uh, a trail of frozen water vapor would be a chemical trail. So, like, the only difference is what chemicals are in those trails. And I even had one person comment one time that made me laugh out loud because it was so obvious. Isn't isn't it isn't it the jet and the fuel that creates that uh, 
you know, because they're saying it's the additives in the fuel now that make it have the differential, blah, blah, blah. Aren't there still chemicals in the exhaust? I mean, it's a jet. Would you go put your face in front of the muffler of your car or truck? Wow, it's winter time and I see that white smoke coming out the muffler. Well, that's not smoke. <laughs> that's just water vapor, right? That's not a chemical, it's water. It's just, it's crazy how ignorant people can be even when they're very well, smart people. So, anyways, let's get some wisdom, not just some smarts. Proverbs, chapter 8. Hopefully I won't run out of time. <laughs> Alright, so, I'm sorry I was long-winded, but I had fun. I hope you did too. Do not, or does not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice. She stands in the top of high places by the way, in the places of the paths. She cries at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. Okay, so this is, um, all throughout Proverbs it mentions wisdom being a woman, so. Does not wisdom cry. Or does wisdom not cry? Is a better way to say it. Excuse me. Understanding put forth her voice. So does understanding put forth understanding's voice as a, a feminine personification? Or is the wisdom, or is the voice of understanding wisdom crying? I don't know. That's an interesting question. Because they're both women. Uh, one's the sister and one's the kinswoman, right? So doesn't really matter that's semantics again right so she cries at the gates at the entry of the city at the coming in at the doors unto you O men I call and my voice is to the sons of man O you simple understand wisdom and you fools be you of an understanding heart hear for I will speak of excellent things and the opening of my lips shall be right things for my mouth shall speak truth and wickedness is an abomination to my lips Wow, <laughs> this is really cool. It's tying in with what we talked about in the beginning. Uh, verse 8 says, All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. Okay. They are all plain to him that understands and right to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. So instruction is better than silver, knowledge is better than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty, witty inventions. Uh, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Okay? So this is wisdom and God saying, I hate a froward mouth, pride and arrogancy and evil ways. Ooh. I think y'all might have missed that. That's a giant cicada killer. They're like this big. The other day I actually saw one catch a cicada in midair and they dropped to the ground. And it killed that locust, and then it picked the damn thing up and flew away with it like it was a... It was crazy, man. Sorry. <sighs> okay, so I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord to hate evil. I've mentioned this multiple times. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Period. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I mean, program that into your brain. Get that. It's not some dic dictator God who's a vengeful God that just wants to kill everybody that doesn't obey. If you hate evil, then you will gain wisdom instantly. Accepting that things are evil. That's acceptance. What do you do with that acceptance? Moving forward, once you accept it as evil, well then you, you're allowed to hate evil. And these are the things that you can tell what what creates evil. Pride, arrogancy, and the evil way. I mean, there's ways that are good and there's ways that are evil. The froward mouth do I hate. A mouth that runs to 
mischief, a mouth that runs to stir strife, a mouth that runs to bad things, right? Talked about it. power, life, and death. There's a lot of people that like to put life into death by spinning people's wheels. And they'll get a whole bunch of dramatic irons in the fire and they'll take a step back and they'll fan the billow to get that fire hot and hot and then they'll watch those blacksmiths hammer themselves to death. <laughs> okay, so counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me, yes, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, the fruit of wisdom is better than gold, yes, than fine gold, even refined gold that's more pure than just regular ore of gold. And my revenue than choice silver. So the dividends that wisdom pays and the revenue you receive from that is better than an investment in silver. I lead in the way of righteousness. In the midst of the paths of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. A lot of people have a lot of inheritance and it's not anything substantial. The zeros on their bank account note or statement might be substantial. But that's nothing of substance. Those are numbers in a system. Or numbers in ink on a piece of paper. Or a barcode on, or a chip on a piece of plastic. Hmm. But I may cause those that love me, wisdom and God, righteousness, those things, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. And I will fill their treasures. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, or ever the earth was. But before the earth ever was, wisdom was there. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Wow, what works of old is that? I think they're talking about Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 could be wrong <laughs> when there was no depths I was brought forth earth was without form and void and the spirit hovered over the face of the deep hmm what depths are they referring to there were no depths well I guess there was nothing to hover over for the spirit because that was over the face of the deep I guess there was no deep and there was no face at this point if I had to assess my opinion when there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. So we don't even have the fountains of the deep yet. We don't have the waters that separated the waters, right? The waters to be separated from the waters. Wisdom's been around for a long time, apparently. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth nor the fields. Whoa, didn't I just say that? Whoa, wisdom. I beat wisdom to it, yeah. <laughs> At least in this reading. I'm pretty sure Proverbs has been around longer than Timmy. So while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he had prepared the heavens, I was there. Wow. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When he set... A compass upon the face of the depth. Hmm. I wonder if that's an allusion to a flat earth. Or should I say planar? That's my term I use when I discuss it. It's planar. It's a plane of existence. Planes don't always have to be plumb. So, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. That's some powerful words right there. 
Now therefore listen unto me, O you children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man, or woman, that hears me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso finds me finds life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But they that sin against me wrong his own or their own soul, and they that hate me love death. Wow. It's almost like <laughs> wisdom and sin are like two opposing enemies. The wages of sin is death. Wisdom is the path to life. Whoa. Pretty interesting. A big butterfly right there. That was pretty cool. It circled around like it was going to fly into my head. I guess nature's having a good time today. Let's we'll see, we've got ten, nine minutes left. So we're at August 8th, and this should be interesting. Oh, my butt talk. <laughs> uh, they weave the spider's web from Isaiah 59, verse 5. It says, See the spider's web, and behold, in it a most suggestive picture of the hypocrite's religion. It's meant to catch his prey, the spider fattens himself on flies, and the Pharisee has his reward. Foolish persons are easily entrapped by the loud professions of pretenders, and even the more judicious cannot always escape. Philip baptized Simon Mad Magus, or Magus whose guileful declaration of faith was so soon exploded by the stern rebuke of Peter, custom reputation, praise, advancement, and other flies are the small game which hypocrites take in their nets. A spider's web is a marvel of skill. Look at it and admire the cunning hunter's wiles. It is not a deceiver's religion, or is not a deceiver's religion equally wonderful? How does he make so bare-faced a lie appear to be a truth. How can he make his tinsel answer so well the purpose of gold? A spider's web comes all from the creature's own bowels. Sometimes when the web's broken too, they'll eat that web back again. So they can re-spin it a new way the next time. It's very interesting. Even so, hypocrites find their trust and hope within themselves. Their anchor was forged on their own anvil. Blacksmith uses the anvil to do the hammering on top of. What are the odds? And their cable twisted by their own hands. They lay their own foundation and hew out the pillars of their own house, disdaining to be debtors to the sovereign grace of God. But a spider's web is very frail. It is curiously wrought, but not enduringly manufactured. It is no match for the servant's broom or the traveler's staff. The hypocrite needs no battery of Armstrongs to blow his hope to pieces. A mere puff of wind will do it. Hypocritical cobwebs will soon come down when the besom of destruction begins its purifying work. Which reminds us of one more thought, viz. that such cobwebs are not to be endured in the Lord's house. We will see to it that they are those who spin them. We will see to it that they and those who spin them shall be destroyed forever. O oh my soul, be you resting on something better than a spider's web. Be the Lord Jesus your eternal hiding place, or my. Be the Lord Jesus thine eternal hiding place. Whew, that was really cool. Um, Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you so thankful and grateful for this opportunity to come together. And we appreciate your um, your ever-loving and patient and enduring ear. The long-suffering that you give to just have to listen to my mouth, God, I thank you for having the patience with it. Um, but I do thank everybody who gets knowledge and wisdom and uplifting encouragement. I thank you for that, God. Um, I thank you for your majesty and your creation. I thank you for wisdom. And that if you delighted in wisdom before you created the creation, uh, give us a little bit of that delight so we can get to know her before uh, the creation gets recreated. 
Um, time is short and nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. So God walk with us today and help us make this the best day um, ever. <laughs> uh, we love you and thank you Father God for sending your only begotten son that we may be saved. Um, that you sent him not to condemn the world but that it might be saved through him. You know, God, we just pray for those who are condemned and that are going down to the paths of destruction and they're not choosing wisdom, but they're choosing ignorance, stupidity. Um, you name it, God. The, the road to evil is wide and the path to righteousness is very narrow. So let us walk this narrow path together and let us hold your hand so that we may not stray. God, in your rod and your staff, do comfort us. And we thank you for that comfort. But when it's time to correct us, let us receive correction. And um, let us marinate. Let us marinate the meat in the milk for a while. So, spiritually speaking, of course. Father God, we just thank you for this time to commune with you and to fellowship with each other. And uh, we just thank you for using this video, this channel, these people, and my mouth all for your glory. And um, you know, we just lift your name up because you're, you're holy and we want to be that way too. So all these things we offer to you, whew, all these things we pray in Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, guys, y'all be good. I'll see y'all tonight. Adios.